Hello friends, it's Kat from Yum Yum Kapow. Recently, we celebrated two huge milestones on this channel and I opened up the floor for questions. I'm so grateful that you've chosen to spend time with me and my silliness here. I hope we get to go on so many more adventures together. I'm gonna be honest for a second and say that I've been in a real bad funk lately and your kind words and stories have really helped keep me going. I could not have predicted nor asked for a better community of beautiful people. I tried to record this video without a script by just answering your questions in front of the camera as they came, but I have about zero ability to stay on topic, so everything got a little rambly and I decided to start over. I will say that a few of you asked questions about why I started this channel, what advice I have for those also looking to start a channel, and what my experience has been like so far. I'm going to make a separate video about all that, so keep an eye out for it when it goes up. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy watching part of this personal project of me embroidering a Fartacuno since I'm Team Mystic in Pokemon Go and wanted to make a silly patch as part of a team uniform. This project has taken about 100 hours so far and I mostly just wanted to show it off if I'm honest. I've linked the materials I use down in the doobly-doo as well as some of the channels of people who ask questions. Please check them out and give them your love since we could all use a little bit of that sunshine you've got inside you. First up, Katie did art, who also has a channel, asked, if you're stranded on an island, what are three art supplies you'd take with you? I gave this a lot of thought, and I'm not sure if we're talking magical, unlimited refill supplies here, or if each individual color of something counts as one item, but if I had a choice, I think I would bring my Pentel RSVP black ballpoint pen, since it can write on pretty much anything, the two mini palettes that are always in my pocket already anyway, and I count as one item since they're never apart from one another, and uh, my panoramic handbook sketchbook. I guess I'll have to make a brush out of my own hair or something since that's three things already. <laughs> Thankfully, she just said island and not desert island, so I assume there's water easily available. Art of Lay and Sarah M asked, where did you get Bubba? Is he from a shelter maybe, or did a superior alien race bestow him upon you for safekeeping perhaps? Now. I've asked Bubba about this alien race matter and he's refused to comment, so the jury's still out on that one. But yes, I did get him from a shelter. I used to volunteer for the Forgotten Cat Shelter, so when it came time to get a snuggly bug, I knew they were legit and doing their best to do right by the animals in their care as well as in the community. Please, if you're looking for a furball to love, check your local shelters. If cost is an issue, many shelters even have free adoption events simply because they find themselves over capacity and genuinely just want to find these sweethearts at home. All of my pets have always been rescues, and they have loved me so deeply and so purely that I've never understood how anyone could not want them. Mia Vox asks, who is your favorite living artist and who is your favorite deceased artist? So, fun fact, I'm really bad at art history, and I once actually got credit on an art history test by genuinely writing, I don't know, one of the Ninja Turtles as an answer. So dead dudes? I don't know, but I'm a big fan of the Dadaist movement in which they basically said that anything is art if you say it is, and promoted not taking all this nonsense so seriously. Living artists? I don't know, probably Dave McKean or Eduardo Riso or Tim Burton or Yuko Shimizu or Tim Sale? Those are pretty much all artists that have had their hands in comic books at some point and have helped to inspire me, especially with their heavy use of black inks or somewhat gothic but mostly noir styles. I think the industry has changed a lot though, and the people we know are artists but don't think apply to this question because they're currently on a smaller path and are valid answers, so I'd like to say that I've always been a fan of Eve Bolt on YouTube, Yuko Nishigaki on Instagram, and the incredibly diverse and skilled group known as Loading Ready Run, who can be pretty much found everywhere on the internet. Espected asked, what is your favorite video that you've made and why? Actually, one of my favorite videos that I go back to watch frequently is the one where I drew a crazy lady riding on the back of her mighty steed, Percival. This video is a pep talk, and while I definitely made it to help other people, I also made it to help myself. Whenever I'm feeling like I can't do something, or it's not worth trying, or I want to give up, I go back and watch that video. It helps me so much, and I hope it's helped others too. Jeanette Andromeda, who's an awesome and ridiculous fellow YouTuber, asks, What were you like in high school? What's changed and what's stayed the same? I'd say probably the biggest thing that's changed is that I no longer wear a long black costume cat tail everywhere. <laughs> My name is Cat, but I very clearly also love cats, and every friend group that I have eventually starts calling me kittens. So as a present for my birthday or something, someone in high school gave me a black cat tail. 
Then they said something along the lines of, I bet you won't wear it to school, to which I said, <laughs> bet you I will, and I wore it for a whole year. True fact. At the beginning of the next year, I tried wearing it again, but it just didn't feel right anymore and I moved on. But as far as what's the same, I've always been weird. I've always been unafraid to be unapologetically who I think I am at any given point. I've always been empathetic and I've always been curious. I just think I'm those things, but even more so now than I was when I was younger. Katara Chaos Weaver very importantly asks, what's your favorite cheese? And I've thought about this good and hard, and I'd have to say that probably burrata is now my favorite cheese. That may sound lame because it's essentially just extra, extra, extra creamy mozzarella cheese, but if you've ever had burrata, I think you know exactly why I've nominated it for cheese of the universe. And if you haven't had it, seriously, get some. If you use burrata in a caprese salad instead of normal mozzarella, it will change your life. Arlie Bean, who by now I surely hope you know is an incredible artist here on YouTube since she's been featured in more than a couple of my videos, asks, do you listen to anything while you make art? This is sort of a complicated question for me as I basically have no ability to process audio passively. My brain thinks entirely in pictures and so having to either produce or consume words takes all of my focus. So while I may sometimes have things that include sound on in the background, they're not really anything I'm paying attention to. In fact, I usually put on such things as Disney movies or dubbed anime or mediocre TV shows or music I've heard many, many times in the background so it doesn't distract me. I can't have anything actually new or super interesting on while I work because it'll distract me. In fact, I've probably watched the Disney Hercules movie a hundred or so times because there's only one part in the whole movie that forces me to pay attention to it. The part where Meg sings, No chance, no way, I won't say I'm in love. That part? Everything else is good, but just sort of familiar and not distracting. Izzy Everett asks, What have been the best and worst art purchases you have ever made? And I've got to be honest, probably the best art purchase I've ever made is the camera I use to record all my videos, because being on YouTube has encouraged me to try new things and grow artistically and connect with super cool people, and if I had been using my nearly dead phone when I first started, I probably wouldn't have had as many grand adventures as I have. Plus, it's made me become a more competent video editor and that in itself is an art. And my worst purchase? Every single cheap supply. Seriously, I spent probably a couple of hundreds of dollars on cheap paints and brushes and pencils and pastels and fabrics and stamp blocks and papers and on and on and on and every single one of those things is cheap for a reason. They break, or they're frustrating to use, or the quality is atrocious, or you don't actually get that much product. I learned the hard way that if you don't have a lot of money to spend, it's well worth it to save for as long as it takes to get something that's actually decent and will actually serve you well, rather than getting the cheapest thing that you can afford in the moment. I'm not saying go out and spend $200 on a hobby you're not sure you're going to commit to or not yet, but if you only spend like $10 on all the supplies you need to try and find out if this is a medium you're interested in or not, you're going to have a bad experience. Having bad tools will only discourage you and make you fight your way uphill against their quality and make you think all the while that it's your fault that you're not having fun. Then, possibly, you'll make the mistake of buying tons and tons and tons more cheap versions of the same supplies, which eventually adds up to be more than if you'd just gotten the good stuff in the first place. Plus, you can always sell good supplies to someone looking for them and make a lot of your money back if it turns out you didn't like them after all. Ari Weaver asks, what creative tool do you think is most versatile, underappreciated, or both? I thought about this for a while and I've realized that probably one of my most used tools across all mediums that I explore is my bone folder. It's good for making creases, turning sewn projects inside out, transferring images and stamp making, securing tape smoothly, creating an impromptu straight edge, making nearly invisible marks on paper while measuring, and so many, many, many more tasks. If you've taken my bookbinding course on Skillshare, then you already know how useful this small, inexpensive thing is and I probably find a new reason to bring it out every week. I feel like only people who do bookbinding have really even discovered bone folders since they're such a traditional tool on the craft and that's really a shame. Lissy Perez wants to know, what is your favorite watercolor brand? And the answer is, I'm split equally between Sennelier and Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith was love at first swatch, but Sennelier and I have gone on a journey together. I didn't like Sennelier at first, but I'd started taking a mini Sennelier palette with me everywhere and accidentally found myself using it more and more when the mini palette of randomized Daniel Smith paints I was also carrying didn't have what I needed. 
Then I realized that every time I was painting a person, I always liked the results more with Sennelier because their layering capabilities helped make subtle undertone colors work better. So I went from mostly disliking Sennelier to now finding them essential. I do need to make a proper review of Daniel Smith paints, but I want to state publicly in case anyone is looking for a recommendation that I love Daniel Smith watercolors and support their use and purchase completely. And for the last question in this video, Joyce Gao asks, what inspires you the most to do art? And I would have to say, life. If I'm happy, my brain is usually working on overtime and every single thing I see inspires me to connect it with some other thing that then results in some sort of project idea. And when I'm depressed and think I don't have anything in me to create, I often find that just writing down or drawing how I feel helps that. I've also talked about some of the things that I do to combat art block, and one of my absolute favorite activities is just going to a public place and painting or drawing the things around me. I find it calming, but I also find it inspiring and a little bit humbling. It makes me feel insignificant in a way that I need, since it removes all pressure of performing well. Nobody knows who I am or cares what I'm doing, and so it just gives me the opportunity to, to be free, to do as well or as poorly as I may, and not feel guilty if it doesn't turn out as expected. My best advice, if you're looking for inspiration, is just to go somewhere. Don't even go there because you're looking specifically for something to inspire you, and don't go there pressuring yourself to make something while you're out. Just go. Go anywhere, do anything, but go. And when you come back, hopefully any anxiety or tension you were feeling is gone and something you experienced or saw or heard has left a tiny seed of an idea in the back of your mind somewhere waiting for its turn to grow. Thank you everyone for asking such thoughtful questions. I know there are a few of you who didn't get answered in this video, so that may mean that you'll find out more in the second one I planned, where we talk about my experiences here on YouTube, my work habits, and why I'm here in the first place. Thank you again so much for all the laughs and smiles and sometimes even deeply personal tears and fears we've shared together over the last year. I can't say enough how truly grateful I am that we've managed to find one another out here in this vast and wild internet and I hope we get to spend many more adventures together as we all keep growing. Until I see you next time, I wish you peace, love, and hot cocoa. Bye! <laughs>